I'm going to go ahead and get started on our day by talking about one of my favorite childhood memories. Um, we used to, uh, I, I grew up here in the Northwest, uh, just about an hour uh, south, an hour south of us, uh, an area called Tacoma, Washington. Um, and when I was younger, we used to get um, pretty big winter snowfalls, maybe not every single year. But what was really fun is we had, we had a really large backyard, and then behind our backyard, we had a huge park that was just um, just right past our backyard fence. And so I remember these days in the winter, right around this time of the year, where <laughs> either the night before, you know, you start seeing it snow before you go to bed, or in the morning you wake up and you just realize, oh my God, it snowed. And I don't know if you were in the same boat, depending on where you're from in the world, but here, you know, first thing we would do is we'd go right to the TV, put the TV on, because we'd have to see on, on the news, on the scroll, they would have all the school closures, because you want to make sure that your school was in that list, heaven forbid you saw you at school on that day, and as soon as you saw your school name there, it's closed, it's just like, you know, that was Christmas Day right there, <laughs> get our clothes on, we'd be out there in the park, and it was just, I mean, all day, it was so much fun. I uh, still think, you know, I look back on, on those memories fondly. Now, what was interesting is uh, we don't get that every year here. Um, in fact, it has become less frequent to get that kind of a, uh, a snowfall. I do recall uh, one of my first real jobs in this world when I was in my early 20s was uh, at a company called Aldous, which eventually got acquired by Adobe. Um, we created products like PageMaker and Freehand, if you've ever heard of those. Yeah. Um, and I gave you that flyer for Pioneer Square. Uh, we were actually located down in Pioneer Square, that's where the, the corporate office was. So it was a, it was a really cool job. Um, and around 1993, I think it was, that winter, we had one of these really massive snowstorms. And the whole office, the whole, you know, all this just shut down completely. A lot of businesses shut down. Um, for a couple of days, two or three days, there were restaurants up in the neighborhood I lived that actually closed permanently because they shut down for two or three days and that's all, they, that, they couldn't afford to come back. It was really kind of a shame. But I thought it was really cool because I was like maybe 23 years old and I just got to stay home. It was like a snow day again back in school. I got to stay home and go up on the, on the hill. We lived up on Castle Hill. We'd go up on the hill, have fun in the neighborhood. I still got paid. That was, was really cool. I got paid. Uh, and I didn't see, that was a huge snowstorm. I didn't see a, a, that big of a snowstorm from 1993. We've had a few over the years, <laughs> but I didn't see another one quite like that until just this last February here in Seattle. Um, we had one of the biggest snowdrops I've seen in a long time in this, in, in this part, of the, part of the country. This is actually up on my street. I took this picture um, as we were walking around our neighborhoods up on Queen Anne Hill, which is right by where the old F5 offices were. And uh, it was about as bad as I'd seen in that 1993 snowfall. And it lasted for a week or, or so. So it didn't melt immediately, which is usually what happens to us here. And so most people did not come into F5. Now I did because I was just up the hill um, and I was able to get down and. But there's another reason why I came in, because all these other people that couldn't come in, it wasn't like it was back in 1993 when my company all just shut down for the day and had everybody stay home and we got to go out and have fun. Times have changed. Now, this last February, when all these F5 employees couldn't come into work because of the snow, they still had to work, didn't they? because of this kind of a product. <laughs> this product has ruined snow days forever <laughs> for all of us. Um, and so that's why I came in. I'm like, well, I'm going to have to work anyways, so I actually just prefer to come into the office myself. So as much as I love our uh, Access Policy Manager, I have a kind of a long history with SSL VPNs, so uh, I kind of a soft spot in my heart for them. I will always say that the SSL VPN has killed our snow day. <laughs> And uh, that's all right because there's always a lot of benefits. Well, the companies love it. Companies love it because of that. Unless the power goes out at home. <laughs> yeah, then they're going to tell you to go somewhere else. Yeah. Then you have to go to a Starbucks. 
and do your work there. Still expecting to do your work now. So we're going to cover everything that we have time to cover about 8 p.m. But now, unlike yesterday with AFM, where we were actually able to really cover a majority of what this product does yesterday, we saw most of it, there's no way we can get through everything that 8 p.m. can do today. Um, we're going to cover, there's, there's, there's so many things you can do with the product, but regardless of what you're doing with it, you're going to utilize the features that we're going to talk about today. And for some of you that aren't familiar with it, we're going to start by going through what APM is for, why we use it, why our customers use it. We're going to talk a little bit about licensing as well, which is something we have not really talked about with any of our other products, but it is something we do have to talk about with APM for a very specific reason. And then lesson two, we'll get into one of the uses of APM where we're creating things like web tops, and different kind of resources that we can make available. Then our probably most popular use cases of APM include both authentication, authorization, and our endpoint control. And that will be around the lunch hour and right after lunch we'll get into all of that. This is stuff you're always, and we will always use with APM. No matter really what use case you're using, that's really the core of what APM is all about. So let's start off just by talking about what APM is. I already mentioned this, it's an SSL VPN. Um, what, is an e what is a VPN? Who can raise their hand and what that stands for? Virtual Private Network. Virtual Private Network, good. You might actually see that on your test. Makes it very possible. Your certification yes. exam. What, uh, aside from an SSL VPN, there's another very well-known type of VPN, very common one. You also might see this on your exam. Could you tell us what that is? IPsec. IPsec. IPsec, that's correct. Um, those are your two main SSL, uh, those are your two main VPN options that we have out there. Now, up until we had SSL VPNs really available to us, and IPsec VPNs were our only option, there were some challenges. Uh, who can tell us some of the challenges with managing client access to our resources using IPsec? Eric? Uh, we need certain ports to access on our, uh, on our for example, um, router who is offering this VPN. And with SSL VPN, we simply have to access 443, which should be opened as well. Okay. Yeah, so... Uh, if you are using an IPsec VPN as, as users and you wanted to go to a customer site and do a demo using UDF and you need to get to the VPN in order to get access to UDF, you may find, I can't connect because the IPsec uh, VPN requires specific ports to be open that may not be allowed through that company's firewall or an outbound. Whereas, as Eric said, SSL VPN requires only SSL, or 443. There is one other challenge, too. Resource issue. Uh, the SSL needs a lot of resources to encrypt. So in this case, so the, if the, there are a lot of the SS, uh, VPN, IP service, uh, the session needs to be done, established between the NTN in this case. So okay, that's, that's definitely a possibility. I, have, I was thinking of something different as well, but that's certainly uh, a challenge. Often you need a client on your device. So not only do you need a client, but more often than not, the actual end user themselves isn't able to install that client. Yeah. It needs to be installed and configured by somebody in your organization, probably an administrator. So it has this specific requirement. Whereas in SSL VPN, all you need is a web browser, Internet Explorer, Chrome. And that makes it available real easy on any one of our device types, no matter if you're using your Mac, your Windows, your phone. All you need is a web browser to connect to your VPN over the virtual private network. So let's talk about what the purpose of a VPN is. And this is, again, if this is new to you or you're not as familiar with the whole concept of a VPN, a virtual private network, a VPN is here so that we can give users 
access to stuff, providing secure access. These users can be on any one of these devices. They can be outside the network, they can be inside the network. It doesn't really matter where they are. We can control that, but they can be coming from anywhere. We like to call this the who. We're identifying who is going to get access. We can identify that who in a variety of ways. We can identify them by their username and password from Active Directory or LDAP server or a one-time password. Many different ways that we can identify the who. We can also do the authorization where we're ensuring that the user is authorized to get access to some things. It's not just the fact that they have an account in your Active Directory database but should they be allowed? And we typically do authorization using group membership. We can also do the who based on the device they're connecting from. So as an employee, I might have full access when I'm using my work laptop, but not having full access when I'm using my phone. So these are all different ways that we can identify the who. Now, I have already identified enough issues in this class that I've decided <laughs> no Apple devices in my network. I can completely block that if I choose to. And that's been my choice for my network. I'm gonna make my life easier. What do we do with those who? What do we do with those people? The whole reason we have a VPN is we're giving those users access to different kinds of resources. We call that the what. What do we want to give them access to? We can give access to a variety of different kinds of resources. Everything from an entire network. The entire network, maybe just a website. One website inside the network, <laughs> maybe just a web page. One web page only. We have what I call a client server application. This is an application that requires more than just what a website requires. So I need a few ports open for this app. I call that a client server app. We can also give users access to remote desktop resources. For example, at home, I want my administrators to be able to manage the IIS servers and the exchange servers using RDP. We can also uh, give access to Citrix hosts and VMware View desktops in this same manner. And then finally, we can give access to an LTM pool. Wait a minute. We've been accessing LTM pools all throughout bootcamp and all throughout LTM fundamentals. Why do I need APM to give access to an LTM pool? That seems a little strange. We'll talk about that in a few more slides. So the VPN combines the who and the what. We determine who gets access to what. That is why we use a VPN. That's the purpose of it. Now, when I worked at my previous VPN, SSL VPN company called Aventail, I think I mentioned that earlier this week, um, I saw the same thing that I've actually have seen ever since I've worked here with APN as well, is when you look at all the different SSL VPNs that are out there available, quite often their feature set is fairly similar, called an apples for apples comparison. Because if that company just came out with something really valuable in their SLVPN, <laughs> odds are this company's gonna introduce it in their product fairly soon. So then what stands APM apart from any of those other SSL VPNs that are out there? Why are our customers gonna choose APM when it has all these other features that most of them have? They all have authentication, they all have authorization, they all have endpoint control. They all support Active Directory, ready to use. But one thing they don't have is the big IP hardware. Every SLVPN, I would probably venture to guess that every SLVPN company uses uh, hardware that they factored from somewhere else, purchased from somewhere else. We create our own hardware, we build our own hardware. And the hardware that you're gonna find at these other companies they probably have two or three different models usually that allow more users. 
So if they need to support 50,000 users, they might need to put 10 of these hardware platforms into their data center. We don't have to do that with the big IP. We have all of our big IP platforms that support a massive amount of users on one device. So we can get everything, we can get all their users that they need on one device. That's kind of cool. We also have APM built right into TMOS, which means we can take advantage of SSL termination, we can take advantage of iRules, we can take care, take advantage of caching, compression, uh, all the other things that we, we, we can have AFM on the same, uh, actually I'm jumping one spot ahead. Now somebody brought something up a few days ago, I don't remember who it was, but when I first started at F5, nine and a half years ago, we actually had two SSL VPNs. Uh, F5 had acquired two different SSL VPNs. I know somebody mentioned it the other day. Who, what, what was it? Mm -hmm. well, and what was the product? Firepass. Firepass. That was a, another SSL VPN. We had two. But Firepass was never built onto the big IP, never built into the TMOS. We purchased it and its hardware that it went on. So we had these other hardware platforms that we were selling just with Firepass. And over the course of a few years, the developers of APM took some of the features from Firepass, built them into APM, and we eventually end of life Firepass quite a few years ago. So now we just have the one product and it is perfect the way it is. But additionally, we have our consolidation story that we talked about yesterday with AFN as well, that we don't just have to have one device that does one thing. My VPN on one hardware, the VPN can exist on the same device as the AFM and the DNS, and maybe the ASM and everything else that we want to support all on one device. Those are things that the competitors can do. Most of them are have really hardware that supports the one function. We have this other concept that I uh, call dynamic resource access. This is what happens when you can use a VPN. This is an example of what a VPN can do. So I've got my laptop here at work. I'm plugged in to my corporate network. I still log in. So I'm logging in with my corporate laptop, my corporate username and password. I'm inside the network. And what I'm finding is that I have access to all the things I need in my, my network. I've got access to everything. I've got access to full Outlook. I've got access to all my file shares, all my client server applications and web apps, everything I need, Lice, you know, F5 licensing site, you know, whatever, whatever they are, I got access to everything. Does that mean that I can log into that SQL server right now? No. I've got access to everything. No. It means I can get to it, like I can get to the front door, I can knock on it, but it doesn't mean I can actually log into it. I would still have to have the local logon rights to get on the SQL server. It just means that I can access anything that I could have accessed had I not gone through APM. But then I take my laptop home. Now I'm at home, or uh, maybe even at my hotel room, let's say, and I'm still logging on to the same corporate laptop. I'm still using my same credentials. But I'm finding that I don't have access to all the same things that I had access to just an hour ago when I was in the office. I no longer have access to my file shares or some of the other applications that I was accessing. But I do still have access to some web apps. I have access to full Outlook and Outlook web access as well. And I have access to RDP into a couple of servers because I'm an administrator, so I can remote administer, administrate those different servers. And then I go over to a friend's house for a couple of hours, and while I'm there, I ask if I can log in with their computer just to check, you know, I want to check something, I check my email, let's say. And I log in from a different workstation, not my corporate laptop, but I'm still using the same username and password. 
And now, a lot less access. I no longer have access to full Outlook. I no longer have access to those client server, uh, the, I'm sorry, the RDP options. All I really have now is Outlook Web Access and a couple other client, uh, a couple of other uh, web apps available to me. And then on the way home, while well, I'm at a stoplight, of course, at a stoplight, <laughs> now I'm driving, I get on my phone and I just check into my VPN. I'm still again using the same username and password, but I'm finding that huh, I've only got access to one thing right now, Outlook Web Access, and that's it, nothing else. Nothing on the back end changed at all. What changed was my environment, what I was doing. So this dynamic resource access is what enables us to give our users the access they deserve at this point in time based on who they are, what they're connecting with, where they're connecting from, and many other things. So we have things like username and password, what device they're connecting from, their corporate device. Okay, their corporate laptop. Maybe they're connecting inside the network. Maybe they're connecting outside the network. Those are different environments. Maybe they're connecting from a specific geolocation. Maybe I'll give them different access if they're connecting from Australia versus China. Are they connecting from the corporate device or from a non-corporate device? I can identify their corporate laptop. I can identify their corporate issued smartphone. And we can make decisions based on that and uh, give them maybe limited, we can identify a, a Android, we can identify uh, I, uh, a, a, Apple, I, iOS, sorry, <laughs> whatever it's called, you know, those other phones. <laughs> and we can also make decisions based on what time of the day it is and what day of the week it is. These are all things that we can take into account when giving dynamic resource access. And all these decisions are made in a single APM access policy, which is what you're going to be playing with for a majority of the day. Now, later on today, at the end of this whole lesson, at the end of the day, I'm going to actually show you the access policy required to do the example I just showed you with connecting from the corporate office, going home, going to my friend's house, and then driving home. I'm going to show you exactly the policy we would need to make the results that we wanted. Once I have my uh, access policy, this really great access policy, what do you suppose we use that access <coughs> policy with? What do we attach that to? Virtual server. Virtual server. I always like to say that all roads here at F5 lead to a virtual server. Virtual server is what ties everything together for us. I think the virtual server is what makes our product so incredibly unique and so, so outstanding. Is that every a virtual server represents an app. Every app has its own virtual server. Every app can have its own AFM. Every app can have its own logging profile. Every app can have its own access policy, and on and on. All of this amazing flexibility we have because of the virtual server. So I mentioned a little bit ago about how we can use APM to provide access for an LTM pool. The words provide access might be uh, a strange set of words because we already have access to the LTM pool. Let's take a look here and let's, let's see why I want to use APM. I may not need to because we have these two pools. I have an intranet pool and an HR app pool of servers. I've created a couple of virtual servers. You guys have already done this. You did this in your LTM fundamentals. We're going to assume these are public IP addresses for this exercise. And my user connecting from their corporate laptop at home, they just have to go to that virtual server. They get the pool. I don't need an APM. Why would I need an APM for that? Oh, but wait a minute. This other non-Lorax employee, since that's a public IP address, they can get access to that virtual server as well. And they can get to our confidential intranet site, they could also get to our confidential HR site. We don't want that. So that's why we would need APM in this case. 
we don't need it to give access, we need to be able to use it to limit access to specific users. I only want my company employees to have access to this. Not even all Active Directory users, because in our Active Directory at Lorax, we also have partners, we have uh, uh, vendors and so forth. I don't want them accessing my HR app either. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna simply add APM, provision that. What, uh, which one of our bundles does APM come with? It's only best. It's only best, and it's, it, it is the best product. It's very good, which is great because you probably know that ASM is also in the best. So once we got best, they can utilize our two best core products that we have for sure. Once I have that provision, I then simply need to create an access policy, as we just talked about, attach the access policy to the virtual server in question. And in that access policy, I will limit using authentication and authorization. I will limit this just to my corporate employees. So when this user connects, they're gonna log in now, which we didn't see before. Now they have to log in first. And only if, and by the way, that could have been any number of methods like we do here at F5. Don't just have to use it. Active Directory username and password. You can do multi-factor authentication, which we'll talk about a little bit later on today. So only if they pass that login check do they get access to the intranet now. And this other user that was able to do this earlier, when they try to connect, they're not going to get authenticated successfully, so now we're protected on these apps. So that's why we're going to use APM with our pools. So, using APM is actually a pretty simple, here's the thing, I'm going to be honest with you guys. I've heard in some circles that a lot of SEs don't do a lot with APM because they find it a challenging product. I hope by the end of the day you're going to agree that everything we're doing is not that challenging. I, I'm, I'm not sure... If I could go out and talk to all these guys individually, like which part is it if it's challenging? I know there's some advanced things you can do, federation, it gets a little bit more tricky, but everything you're gonna do, I feel it is so user intuitive. Everything. Um, I'm gonna iterate that, I'm gonna reference that several times today as we talk about it. Um, when you see these two items here on your nav bar, your wizards, your access, those are your two ways of knowing that APM is provisioned at this time. So we can set up a new access policy slash profile. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Access profile, access policy. We can set it up manually if we want, but I actually recommend that we use these wizards. Um, I think it's by far the best way to get an access policy started. It's probably never going to be your finished product, but I think it's the best way to do it, to get it started. I don't usually like wizards in a lot of products, but I think these wizards work really well. So we have three different wizards we can use. What the core use of an SSL VPN is for a lot of companies is it's a way to give all of your corporate users at home access to your corporate network through the VPN. Network access. And that's what we can do here. Now, we're not going to cover network access today for a couple of reasons. Um, I've been told that it's we don't see that use case as much with our employees. I'm sorry, with our customers. It's one of the reasons why I took it out. However, I have a VLAB demo for you that you can do, and you will see that actually setting up network access using APM is so incredibly easy. It is probably one of the easiest things to set up on APM. And the wizard's gonna do majority of it for you. So I encourage you to take a look at that demo after sometime after you're done today, so you can just learn a little bit about network access. We're also uh, gonna play with portal access. We'll do this in lesson two. So I'm gonna wait until we get to lesson two to talk more about this. The third wizard here, 
The third wizard, got that nice simple name, it just rolls off the tongue there. Web Application Access Management for Local Traffic Virtual Servers Wizard. That just flows, doesn't it? Um, but that's your simple way of saying that this is going to create an access policy to protect that virtual server and pool that we just talked about. That's what I want to do. I wonder how long that wizard might take. Well, let's take a look at what all we need for the wizard. What we need is this. All you really need to know when you set this up is what authentication method am I using? Am I using Radius? Am I using one-time password? Am I using Active Directory? And if I am using Active Directory, I just need to know the Active Directory server details. If I know that information, I can set up this access policy in about 45 seconds, and then I'm done. And that's what you're going to do in your first wizard. I'm sorry, your first exercise. Could not be easier, I don't think. Unless you could just think it and blink it, and then it was done. That's about it. That's about the only way you can make it any easier. <laughs> now, the next part of lesson one is we're going to talk about APM licensing. We don't talk about ASM licensing or AFM licensing, but we do talk about APM licensing because we do have a slightly different licensing requirement for this product that we don't have in our other products. And I want to make sure you guys understand it. In order to identify whether or not we need to worry about this additional <coughs> licensing requirement, we don't always need to worry about it. So in order to identify if we need to worry about it, you'll want to understand the, the use you're using, the deployment use that you and your customer are setting up for APM. And APM typically falls into a couple of deployment scenarios. So I'll explain those first. The first scenario is where we're truly using APM for what we acquired it as, an SSL VPN. An SSL VPN is used to give those remote users access to things like the network resource. They're at home, they want to come through their VPN to get access to the entire network. That is the SSL VPN. They could also be using it to access things like portal resources. We're going to talk about portal resources in lesson two. These both are APM resources, a network resource and a portal resource. We only have those available because we have APM provision. That deployment scenario is using APM as a true SSL VPN. The other deployment scenario, we just talked about this. I've got my virtual servers. I've got my pools. That's an LTM thing. You don't need APM for that. I'm giving users access to applications via a virtual server. However, I would like to do some authentication. I'd like to authenticate my users and only give authorized users access to this virtual server in the pool. So for that, I'm going to add APM to this big IP. And I'm only using APM for authentication, authorization, and maybe even endpoint control, which allows me to check their device. And I call this deployment scenario user identity and access management. You don't have to use APM for authentication on LTM, though, do you? How else are you going to do it? Well, because APM is going to consume licenses if you just wanted to authorize. Not necessarily. It doesn't. It doesn't have Not necessarily. Not uh, hold that thought, but how else are you going to do authentication though without APM? If I don't know, if there was a you could add an auth policy to an LTM V server, a virtual server. But you're going to add a what? An auth policy. And where's policy. where? But where is all your where's your user database? You're gonna, you going to you still could have it. I mean, you know, no. for for a uh, no. you need to have APM for this. Really? Yeah. yeah. Just for like an e-commerce site, I mean, just any kind of. That's well, the, are you? Oh, so you're. We're talking about if all of your users are in a, a data source like Active Directory or Radius. If you're talking about my 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 my, uh, I'm doing a web app, yeah, and I'm doing authentication, but the users are actually stored in like a SQL Server, let's say, that's different. Yeah, that's different. We're talking about authenticating corporate users who are stored in Active Directory. Right, Active Directory. 
but license consumption is not necessarily a requirement. We are going to consume a license. Let me rephrase that. We are going to consume a license, but we don't always have to, the customer doesn't always have to pay for it. That's what I'll, and, and that's what I'm getting at. That's where we're going with this. So hold that thought. So these are the two deployment scenarios first. Notice I'm not giving access to anything like portal resources down here. I'm not giving access to network resources. They're only accessing pools. And of course, hopefully, they're also using additional F5 products as well, like AFM and ASM, to really utilize all the best that we have available. The next thing we need to understand in order to identify this possible licensing requirement are user sessions, access sessions. Well, user sessions. All the licensing is based on user sessions. So what is a user session? Over here, we got Bob, and Bob is connecting to the SSL VPN APM up here because Bob wants to access the network. So as soon as Bob has essentially touched this APM, Hello, APM. As soon as Bob has touched the APM, that APM is now going to consume an access session, called an access session, for that user. And that user gets to hold that access session for as long as they stay connected. That could be an hour, that could be eight hours, that could be three days for all we know. Now what's interesting is that Bob could then log in using his phone to the same APM while he's connected on his laptop and consume a second access session. He could then connect from his tablet to the same APM and consume a third access session. It is possible for one user to consume multiple access sessions when they are connecting using multiple devices or maybe he's running a virtual environment in here and he has a Windows workstation image inside of there. That would also qualify as a different workstation. Bob also connects here because he wants to get access to this pool, going to this web app. And as soon as he connects to this APM, he also consumes an access session. There it is. So anytime a user connects to an APM from a device, they're going to consume an access session and hold that access session for as long as they stay connected. Each unique connection. It's important to note that although a single, a single user can consume multiple access sessions in this manner, um, only from multiple devices, they cannot consume a second access session from the same device on the same APM unless they're using a virtual environment in some manner. Okay? So that's an access session. That's the first kind of session we're going to talk about. Now we can limit that. And in most cases, I recommend that we limit that. Because if we don't, Bob could use 80 devices possibly and consume 80 access sessions if he happened to have 80 devices. So we probably want to limit, to a certain degree, how many simultaneous sessions one user could hold open. Now, the reason Bob was accessing this APM from his laptop was because Bob wanted to have access to this network. So as soon as APM gave access to the user to this APM resource, known as a network resource, APM now holds another session for this user. It's known as a connectivity session or a CCU. So now Bob has an access session open from that laptop and a connectivity session open from that laptop. <clears throat> now, likewise, just like one user from one device can't consume more than one access session, one user from one device can't consume more than one connectivity session. So once Bob's already established a connectivity session from his laptop, he's accessed the network, now he's gonna access this resource, 
and this resource, and this resource. He can access all these APM resources he wants. He's not going to consume additional CCU sessions or connectivity sessions from that same access session. But uh, before I get to that, I remember Bob also connected to this APM via the virtual server, but this is not an APM resource. This is an LTM resource. So APM does not consume an act, uh, connectivity session for that. The only thing that's going to be consumed in this scenario is the access session. No connectivity session needed for LTM pools. Is that the non-license concerning scenario? Correct. So the CCU is only the uh, connectivity session. Connectivity session when users are connecting to things like network resources via APM or portal resources via APM. That is going to consume a connectivity session or a client server app, which we'll talk about more in lesson two. It's, it's been debated. Uh, if CCU is uh, used for only the APM, only for APM, only so is an access session. Access sessions and connectivity sessions you're only going to come across with APM. They're both APM features. Just for whatever sake, is it possible to fake that out? You know, someone wanting to use corporate network resources and creating a, an LTM network virtual server and not consuming those licenses? And not using APM? You know, using APM but not consuming a license, the second scenario you're talking about, just to create. So if you made this a network uh, forwarding virtual server, sure, of course. Don't tell the, me. The, the, the easy way to identify it is go look at your access policy, which we'll look at later, and go look at the resources you're giving out to your user. And if one of those resources is a network resource, when they access that, they're going to be consuming a connectivity session. If you're able to give them access to the network without that resource, APM's not even going to care. Have nothing to do with APM. That could have huge implications for licensing, though. Well, let's. First off, we are no different from any other SSLVPN company. Every SLVPN company has the same sessions and licensing requirements. We're no different. So it's not like we're not like we're charging more than anybody else does. Let's mm -hmm. put it that way. In fact, if anything, I believe we charge less. Is it? Uh, Hold on, Matt. How is yeah. that question? Uh, it's clear for me for the access connection uh, to count how many user or devices, how do we count the connectivity session? Is it uh, the, the, the TCP uh, session? Is it the resources we configure within the APM? When, a, when, when, when you are setting up APM and you're setting up a policy, you're going to potentially create resources, which we'll do in lesson two. If any of the resources you're creating are portal resources, or network resources, or app tunnels, uh -huh. anytime one of your users has connected to APM, and they've connected because they want to go to one of those resources, that's going to consume the connectivity session. But once they consume that connectivity session, they can go to another resource, and another. they can use all the resources they want during that session, they'll still just have consumed a single connectivity session, but they will have consumed a connectivity session the moment they connect to one of those APM resources. If they don't consume, if they don't ever go to one of those APM resources, they'll never consume a connectivity session. All they'll do is con uh, uh, consume an access session. For example, in this scenario, when I authenticate the user, they're consuming an access session, but they're never accessing an APM resource down here. So it's some kind of front-end licensing, back-end licensing? Yeah, you might think of it that way. I, I, I wouldn't necessarily... I you might think of it that way for a picture in your head, yeah. but I wouldn't necessarily <laughs> summarize it that yeah, way with yeah, anybody. Yeah. Um, have a good question. Yeah. Yeah, so I've heard one VPN session, uh, one VPN user is equal to one CCU. 
one VPN user or one CC user is equivalent of four apps. So You've that? heard that? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean uh, I've never heard that. <laughs> because, uh, I mean, no, I'm not sure what that would refer to. One CC was the equivalent of four access sessions? Uh, one VPN user is equivalent of four access sessions. I have no idea where that, where what that means. So, uh, where have you heard that from? You have to. I mean, the expert, I mean, uh, there, there are people, you know, they see in our team that have been in the company for. Well, let's years. find out who that is yeah. because that makes no sense to me. Yeah. And maybe what they're saying is this. What they're probably, actually, I'm going to ask that question in a couple of slides, okay? okay. And, and then, and that might be what they're thinking. I'm not positive, but I think I might know what they're talking about. But let me let me let me address it in a minute. The logic that I've heard from them is one access session could be authentication session, could be network session, could be an access No, a network session, session is not an access session. A network session is a connectivity session. End to end. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know. So I was told one VPN user equals four access sessions. You know, when we uh, size the solution, there is CCU, there is access session. Correct. So and one user could consume one of each. Yeah. So they could consume an access session and a connectivity session. They could. But you're saying one user is equivalent to four access sessions. At most, I could see one user is the equivalent of one access session and one connectivity session. But as a reminder, as a reminder, Bob can do this. Bob can connect to the network from his laptop. He has just consumed an access session and a connectivity session, correct? But Bob can also connect using his smartphone to this resource. That's a different device. So that same user has now consumed a second access session, but because it's a different device and they're going to a portal resource, they've consumed a second connectivity session. Well, now this one user has consumed four licenses. They're not, or four sessions. They're not all access sessions. It's two access sessions and two connectivity sessions. But this statement that you're making that one user is the equivalent of four access sessions makes no sense to me whatsoever. Unless they are trying to size it in this manner. So again, let me just step ahead for one second. So again, it is possible, if we're allowing this, if we're allowing this, it is possible for one user to consume multiple access sessions and multiple connectivity sessions using multiple devices. That is possible, but we can limit that if we choose to, okay? So when we are now trying to decide how many licenses do I need of each type, how many access session licenses do I need? How many connectivity sessions to licenses do I need? Do, does my customer need to buy more? Do they need to spend more money? We have to take into account a couple of things. Which platform are they on? Which platform did you sell them? And what's their maximum user requirement? How many users are they anticipating going through their VPN? 2,000, 10,000, 30,000? Do they want to allow their users to have multiple sessions open at the same time from their laptop and their smartphone and their tablet? If that's the case, then they might need to account for that. What I'm thinking is what you've possibly heard is it's a good rule of thumb to account for four access sessions per user when you're sizing so that they can open up their VPN on their laptop and their phone at the same time, and they won't max out of their access sessions. That's what I'm guessing yeah. is what so you've heard. This is on uh, the product page, you know, the sizing uh, for different uh, platforms. So for example, you have uh, for uh, i2600, um, say you have 2,500 CCUs. Right. And then for access sessions, you have 10,000 uh, access sessions. Okay. So that's 2,500 times 4 equals 10,000. Um, that's how it's been. I mean, it's on the website. So, again, they're saying to have four times the number of four access minutes. sessions as CCUs. Yes. yes. But that's odd because we don't always need CCUs. No, that's how it is. I can show you. 
Well, you still do, but don't worry about it now. But show it to me later, because I'm really curious to see if I'm, uh, if, if maybe it's, if it's how it's stated. I'm curious if, how it is this stated and who's stating it. Is this licensing only done on the hardware? I don't see how this could be done on a VE in a public cloud or something. Oh, no, it's definitely a VE thing, too. Oh, it is? Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. So, like, is there a phone home data then after someone deployed it in the cloud that says, yeah, this many sessions? Is there a which? Uh, to... Like a phone home telemetry back home that tells us how many sessions are being used or something? We could always go monitor that. There's a there's a reports we can run in APM that shows us how many sessions are opened and how many have been opened. You can just deploy a best without talking to anyone and without estimating anyone and start using APM. You can. Absolutely. Let me explain. Okay. Let me explain. All right. So again, I told you that this is based on a couple of things: the platform and their user need. Each platform has a very specific amount of access sessions that are made available initially and are even available on that device. So for example, on this 4800, it comes with a base access sessions of 10,000 users. Comes with that. When I say it comes with that, that means the moment you have provisioned APM, that product comes with 10,000 access sessions. <laughs> no additional charge needed for that. They're not paying anything extra for those 10,000 access sessions that come with APM. Each of the hardware platforms also has a maximum number of access sessions available. In this platform, it's the same, which means we cannot increase the max access sessions for that particular hardware platform. Each hardware platform also has a certain number of CCUs that are available for free. I shouldn't say are available, excuse me. Each platform also has a number of CCU licenses that are given to them for free when they provision APM. This one comes with 500. The 10,800 series has 60,000 access sessions for free as soon as they provision APM. They could go up to a million if they choose to, and it also comes with 500 free connectivity session licenses. This is kind of our maxed out, this is like the big beef here. Our maxed out Vibrion, maxed out blades, best blades available. Anybody know what, uh, how many access sessions come with that? Any guess? Nothing, because it's just the uh, chassis. Well, no, it's all, it, it, it's, it's all maxed with, out. Okay, okay. Right? okay. Yeah. So it's per blade. We've got all the blades in there. Don't worry about per blade. Okay. Like, I'm sorry? That's not how many that come with it. That's not what comes with it. But what comes with it is actually 200,000. That, when you provision APM, as soon as you provision APM, they get 200,000 access session licenses for free. They can go up to 2 million. They still only get 500 CCUs, interestingly. By the way, our competitors don't give access session licenses for free. Not all of them. Some might. But a lot of them charge for these access session licenses that we're giving away for free. These three, by the way, these three scenarios are all SSL VPN deployment scenarios. They're all being used as an SSL VPN a, uh, APM. This scenario this is just being used for the user identity and access management. We've got LTM, we have virtual servers and pools. We're only going to be using APM to authenticate users and authorize users. This Viprion 4800 series comes with a base access session licenses of 100,000. They can go up to a million. Still, they come with 500 CCUs for free. But hey, at least it's for free. So we have to ask ourselves in each one of these four scenarios is, does the customer have to buy anything else? Do they need to purchase any additional licenses? So in this first, in this first example, they are using this as their SSL VPN. They're gonna be giving users access to the corporate network. So they're absolutely gonna need CCUs. How many CCUs do they need? 
Well, they got about 5,000 users in their, in their uh, organization, but they also want to account for the fact that some of those users are going to be open more than one session at a time from their laptop and their phone, and they also want to account for growth in the next year and a half. So they're going to be purchasing an additional 7,000 CCs, giving them a total of 7,500. They've made this determination. They haven't, I mean, we didn't necessarily need to use a mathematical, you know, but you could, but they have put some very specific thought into how many CCUs they needed. You need to think about SSL transactions also in that case of size and purposes. Well, of course, but that's the hardware platform. If, if we've realized after the fact that we're not gonna be able to do enough SSL transactions because we put them on the wrong platform, then that's, mistake. We can't up that at this point. We can't make that better without giving them a better piece of hardware. In this scenario, they're using this for all their employees and their partners and their vendors. Their employees and partners need to go through the VPN to access portal resources. So the employees are accessing core, uh, network resources, but these other users are accessing portal resources. Those also consume CCUs. So we need licenses for all those users, connectivity session licenses. Around 15,000 total employees, partners, and vendors. But again, we also want some users to be able to have their session, two sessions open at the same time. We want some growth. So they're gonna be buying 20,000 additional CCUs. Notice they haven't had to buy any additional access sessions. No money spent on that. For any hardware model, we can purchase additional CCUs up to the number of access sessions that we have. Not up to the number of max access sessions that's available. We can purchase the number of CCU licenses up to the number of access sessions that they have on the device at this time. So with that being said, this organization wants to max out the number of CCUs available to them at this time for their worldwide SSL VPN. They have so many users that need to use this VPN. So at this time, how many CCU licenses can they purchase? 1.95 I'm not sure if I exactly heard it exact yet. I heard it close. 199,500. 199,500. They already have 500, so they can't go over 200,000 this time. That's all the access sessions they have. So they can go up to 200,000 CCUs. If they purchase additional access sessions, they could then purchase additional CCUs as well. Now, in this scenario, in this scenario, we're not using this APM to give access to network resources. We're not using it to give access to portal resources. We're only using it for authentication and authorization. That does not require any CCUs. So at this point in time, all they needed was to provision APM and utilize the 100,000 free access sessions that they got with it, and they don't need to buy anything else in that scenario. Is everyone, I want to make sure everyone's clear on that. They don't have to buy anything else because they're not using network resources and portal resources. Well, so at what point do the, does the max access session come into play then? They've decided that they need more than 100,000 users to access their virtual servers and pools. So because they want more than 100,000 users to access it, they could choose to purchase an additional 100,000 access sessions. So they now have 200,000 access sessions here. But that still is just being used for authentication, authorization, and point control, not for giving access to in network resource. But is, is that a hard limit for CCUs in, in that case? Are they like, say they up the, the access sessions to 2 million, can they then add CCUs? Absolutely. They can go up to the number of access sessions they have on that device. 
But this one, we can't go any higher because right. can't raise that one. But this one, we could. We could raise that one up to 100,000 and they could, then they could purchase up to 100,000 CCUs. Mm -hmm. Can we really have one million of users connected on the VIP uh, 10,800? No, we just tell people that. You can at least buy it. Of course we can. Um, <laughs> I, I have it. It's, I, I, you know, I'm sure it's been tested. Really? In, but ha is anybody actually doing that? I don't know. I doubt it. But I would, this I would have to feel very confident that our really? developers have tested this and we're not just putting that number out there and making it available when it's absolutely impossible. Now keeping in mind, keeping in mind, if you're going to do that, if you're going to use this and max it out to a million, and you're also using this for all of your e-commerce and your online banking and you've got tons of other stuff going through there, now you're going to overload yeah, that sure. device. I, I, I would only that. bump it up to a million if that is a dedicated, for sure. it's dedicated for just sure. for APM, and that's it. And you have four blades. That's of course, it's got to be maxed out. Yeah. On, the, on the Vitrium, I, uh, I can understand. On the, the uh, ICU is so powerful. Cool. No. But the, the thing is, everyone thinks there's something magical about SSL VPN. It's still just SSL. Yeah. I mean, the state you have to keep is the SSL state. And then whatever so no big deal for the big IP hardware. Uh, no, what? I no big deal for the big IP hardware. Here no. we are talking about but here's the but, but again here's the thing people ask sizing questions, questions all the time. I mean we don't cover state. we don't cover sizing for a lot of reasons. It's not an exact science. It's not even close to an exact science. It is a very 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 complicated subject to get into sizing. I'll explain why. I can't just give you an answer from three or four questions. I have to know many things. When somebody says, well, isn't there, a, what hardware platform should be on, I be on? I say, well, how, how many apps do you support? First of all, let's start with that. How many apps? A hundred? Okay. Now for each of those apps, how many of your users are you expecting to hit all those apps on any given hour? We've got to figure that out. And then what all do you want to enable on those apps? Do you want to just enable LTM or do you want to also add APM rules and denial of service protection. You also want to have a WAF policy. You want to do an authentication authorization. All of that for every single app, for every hundreds and thousands of users, that's also going to change the equation. So there's so many variables that go into determining the right platform. You can't just ask them two questions and be done with it. What I would always say though, is don't ever try to undersell your hardware and in, have them end up seeing slower traffic. We don't want that. Uh, the F5 has a kind of the configuration tool for the diving unit the license. It means that that's all, example, put the something the uh, value and the generate the something the uh, mm -hmm. license, like required license number or something by, by Excel or something like that. I'm not sure if I'm understanding the question. Yeah. So somebody else calcul it? Sizing calculator. Calculator. Yeah. Calculator. Oh. Users, applications. Yeah, I know that there's been sizing calculators. I've never seen them in action. So I, I know some people have tried to develop them, but it's still not an exact science. Yeah, there's a data sheet, an internal data sheet we have. Yeah. In, in I mean, even when it comes to a WAF policy, when you add your WAF <coughs> policy, it could be very, it could just be doing signature checking, or it could be doing signature checking, brute force protection, web screen, you know, the more you add on to it, you know, there's so many variables. That's my point. There's so many variables. So it it is something that you will learn to get better at over time, but it's going to be tough in your first year. You can't just go out and make a quick platform decision just like that. You'll probably need some help with your mentor and so forth. But I'm going to move, I'm going to move on because I want to get into sizing or else we'll just rabbit hole right now. Yeah, can I ask one more question? Yeah. Uh, do you feel the difference between these two use cases, LTM plus VPN versus SL VPN use case? Sure. We're not giving access to anything that's APM related here. That's the simplest summary. We're not giving access to anything that is APM related. Here we are. For example, a network resource. A network resource 
is only available to us because we have APM. A portal resource is only available to us because we have APM. An LTM pool is not available to us just because we have APM. We have LTM pools without APM. So this does not require a CCU when I'm giving access to this pool. All I'm using APM for is to authenticate the user. That's it. Just authenticate the user. That's the only use of APM. We're not connecting them to anything. I'm not connecting them to an APM resource. We're just checking who they are and then letting them through. Well, that's about the easiest way I can summarize that. And we'll look at it a little bit more as we go on. I'll point out the things that are going to consume a CCU. Just one last question, a uh, very quick question. Are you aware of uh, a resource that explains accessation and CCUs? There is a document I've seen out there, but it's not that it's not that comprehensive. It's not that comprehensive. Yes. Um, there really are three main culprits: network resources, portal resources, and app tunnels. If your users are getting access to those three kind of resources, you're talking connectivity session licenses. Yeah, uh, I, I tried to, to look for that and... Uh, well, I just, I just told you the answer. Mm -hmm. I just, I just, uh, an RDP resource does not use a CCU, which we'll talk about later. Mm -hmm. So I just, I just, I mean, I gave you probably the best uh, guideline that I can give you. If you are giving users access to those three resource types, you need to start having a connectivity session CCU license discussion with your customer. Also, there's a good dude in Europe. I don't know if he's uh, out of Paris and he's the yeah. Uh, yeah, he's, he's good. I've had him involved. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I know him. All right. So, if you have more questions about the licensing, come see me after when we go to do your break. Uh, but that is that's the end of our licensing discussion. Again, it's very important because you do want to make sure that you're not just giving them the best bundle. Say, have fun, provision APM, I'll see you later. And then they're calling you saying, my users are getting timed out, they're getting you know, blocked out. Why are they getting blocked out? Oh, I, are you using network resources? I had no idea. I should have asked you that. Yeah, you should have, you should have asked them, why are you using APM? Why are you buying this from us? How are you using it? That's a discussion you should have had ahead of time. All right, so, to set this up, we're going to talk about a couple of things that get involved, and then you'll do your first exercise here. The top level object for APM is called an access profile. An access profile. Um, I'm showing you here how to create an access profile from scratch. But if you use the wizard, the wizard will do it for you. But I want to show you this for one main reason here. So if I go to my Access uh, Profiles page, I can click on, uh, ah, again, the advice was we'll do that for you. I can click on Create over there and give it a name. I can select the type. Now the type was something that was added a few versions ago and that can just trip people up. My advice, if you're gonna create these manually like this, is just always set the type to all. I will explain a little bit later on today what happens when you change this to something other than all. But in most cases, just leave that set to all. The reason I wanted to show you this screen was because the main uh, configuration options for the profile itself are these kind of values. Timeout values. These are actually something that's an important thing to take into consideration because knowing that we're only getting a certain amount of session licenses, access sessions and connectivity sessions. And it's possible for Kevin to check his email before he goes on vacation from home. He gets on the VPN, checks his email, and then he walks away and gets on the plane and he never logged out. So since he never logged out, he never released that session. And now that session is held for him for his entire week of vacation. We don't have those kind of license, we don't have enough sessions to let that happen. So having maximum session timeouts and inactivity timeouts is really valuable. There's another option you see on this page, maximum sessions per user. That's where we can limit maybe only three sessions 
at most for each user. When it's set to zero, there is no maximum. Now there's another possible issue, or uh, there's something else that could happen. We'll, we'll say it's an issue, but it's, we'll just say this is something that could happen with our APM deployment. So I have, on my APM, I have it, I'm being using it for two different groups of users, my employees and my partners. So I have two different VIPs that I'm using. VIP 1 connects to the APM policy for my employees, and VIP 2 is being used to connect to the APM policy for partners. And we have a total of 5,000 access sessions. That's it. And I'm getting phone calls from my employees all the time say that they can't connect. They can't connect. They can't connect. So I finally go and I run a report and I look at some statistics and I find out that the partners are consuming 4,000, 4,500 access sessions. The number of access sessions I have available, that is spread out over all the access policies that I have on that box. So at this point, my partners are stealing all the access sessions, leaving just a few left for my employees. And that's not what I wanted. So what I can do on this page here is we can also, for each access profile, I can specify the maximum number of sessions for this profile. So for my partner's profile, I might max them out at 2,000 sessions, and for my employee's profile, I might max them out at 3,000 sessions. So these are some of the settings contained within the access profile. Not much else. There's a couple of things down below that, but those, that's pretty much the core of the access profile. Does the maximum user apply to the access session? Uh, does it has an impact That's on the how access many session? access sessions they have available. So if one user has opened up 10, they've taken 10 away from that maximum amount. Yes. Okay, but this will not limit anything on the CCU, on the connectivity session? It's, they can't have a connectivity session license unless they've already consumed an access session license. You cannot consume a connectivity session without consuming an access session first. Yes, I'm okay with that. Just to know if the, these settings will uh, limit the access session and the connectivity session. I believe it's just for the access sessions. We go back and look one slide. That just says maximum concurrent users. I'm not positive on that, to be honest. I, but I, yeah. but I, I don't think it's relevant because you can't have more CCUs than access sessions. So if you're maxing that out at 2,000, it's not like, oh, I've somehow consumed 2,000 access sessions, but 2,500 CCUs. That's not really possible. Fully so I don't think it's, I don't think it's an important thing to worry about. I don't think. So as a reminder, the profile, the access profile, is what is actually attached to the virtual server, which you would see over here once we've done that, once we've attached it. But again, if you use the wizard, it does it all for you. Does all that work for you? Oh, there it is. Now it's attached to the Lorax virtual. Now, the access profile also contains what's called the access policy. I've referred to the access policy several times. These two phrases are used synonymously sometimes. Hmm, do I want an access profile or do I want an access policy? Well, one access profile contains one access policy, so they kind of are the same thing. But the profile contains everything I just showed you. Timeout settings and so forth. The access policy is where all the magic happens. So I now want to edit the access policy for this profile, and I can do that with that little edit link right there. And that's gonna pull up the feature that we have that is so incredibly exciting that it requires a little bit of word art. Very, very cool. Now this is uh, the feature of APM that actually does set APM apart from our competitors. Aside from anything else we talked about earlier, it's our visual policy editor. I'm sure many of you have probably heard of this, or the VPE. When I worked at Aventail, one of the questions I got 
the most from people was asking about some sort of a visual representation of their, their policies. And we didn't really have that. There was nothing in a graphical format for them to see. This is the visual representation of a policy we're going to put together. And you will undoubtedly never do an APM demo where you don't go in and show the visual policy editor in some manner. It is definitely one of the standout aspects of APM. This is where we make all those decisions, all those access policy decisions we talked about earlier, such as checking their endpoint, checking their device for things like antivirus software, and firewall software. We can check the environment variables, things like what day of the week it is, what time of the day it is, what IP subnet they're connecting from, what geolocation they're connecting from. We can grab credentials from the user. We can grab their username, their password, we can grab their one-time password, whatever credentials we want to grab from them. We can then use those credentials and send them to the appropriate backend authentication servers. Send it to the Active Directory server or send it to the Radius server. We can authorize the user based on things like Active Directory group membership. We can then give the user access to some of those APM resources we talked about, like a network resource or a portal resource. We can also tell the users that are not being allowed access why they're not being allowed access. So instead of just failing somebody because they don't have the antivirus software, we can tell them, sorry, you don't get to connect at this time because you don't have our required antivirus software on your computer. So over here we talked about having these two VIPs. So remember that each VIP has one access profile, and each access profile has one access policy, and each access policy has one start point. That means that every employee that's accessing that VIP, every employee is starting here. And then they're going through in some manner, and every user is going to end up somewhere over here on one of our ending points. We actually have three ending points even though it looks like we have more. We only have three. We have the allow ending point, the deny ending point, and then our third ending point is called a redirect. And a redirect ending point lets us create an ending point with a URL attached so we can send the user somewhere, like a web page where they can get information on how to get their antivirus software installed. You guys will play with that, I think, later on today. So I want to talk about how these branches and these decisions are made as a user is starting over here and making their way over to the right side of the policy. So as we said, everybody starts with the start point. And they move over and they hit the first item. When you see fallback, one fallback branch. Fallback branch means all users are going to go this way when there's just the one fallback branch. So the first item type is one that only has a fallback branch coming out of it and nothing else. These item types are either they're doing one of two things. They're either getting some sort of information from a user or they're telling the user something, but they're not making any decision. So they're getting information or they're telling information such as getting login information. Just tell me what your username and password is. That's all, I'm, all I care about. And then everybody moves forward. All users, because we have the one fallback branch. Then the next item type is one that has two branches. It will always just have two branches, a successful branch and a fallback branch. This is a yes, no item, true, false item, one, zero. They have it or they don't. 
So in this case, we're going to take those login credentials and send it to the Active Directory server, and we're only going to get one of two answers back. Good uh, authentication or bad authentication. So if Active Directory sends back a good authentication response, then the user is going to go to the successful branch. If Active Directory says, sorry, that username and password is not valid, then the user is going to go to the fallback branch. And so in this item type, when we just have two branches, the fallback branch, in truth, really should say failure. Success, failure. Now in this case, because they failed, uh, they're going to get, get this uh, prompt. Here's another example of a single item. I'm sorry. Here's another example of an item with a single branch. The message box. But this, this is one that's just telling the user something. It's not getting information from the user. It's telling them something, but not making any decisions. All the users are going to head over and end up here. Any users that don't uh, authenticate successfully. Well, let's come back up here where uh, we have, ah, there we go. Okay, some users for a remediation site. But let's come back over here where we have the successful, successfully authenticated users. They're now gonna move to the next item. And this item type is one that has multiple branches, many different branches. This is like a firewall rule list, some sort of a list where I'm only going to match, excuse me, I might match more than one, but I'm only going to go to the branch that I match first. So it's possible that I can have, have many of these items, but I always will follow the branch that I match first. So this is my date time check. I can check what time of the day it is, what day of the week it is, and make decisions. And we have three different branches. We have the lunch hours branch. That is configured Monday through Friday from one, uh, 12 to 1. We have the business hours branch. That's Monday through Friday from 8 to 5. And then the weekend branch. That's Saturday through Sunday all day long of each day. So this user is connecting at Thursday at 2.30. They're not going to match the lunch hours branch because it's not between 12 and 1. So they're going to go to the next branch, and they do match the second branch, business hours. So they're going to follow the first branch they match. Now here's a third item that just has one branch. We're going to give them something. We're giving them resources. And then they're all going to be allowed access to that. It's possible when you have this multiple branch scenario, that a user could match more than one branch. For example, if you're doing a branches for a group membership, we might have one branch for the employees group and another branch for the sales group. Well, you're all in both of those groups. So you would actually match both of those branches. So for example, this user is connecting on Saturday from 12, at a Saturday at 12.15. And uh, actually I made a mistake on my lunch hours branch. That's just any time 12 to one, any time 12 to one. So in this case, because of that, they could match both. It is between 12 and one, and it is Saturday and Sunday. So in this case, the user could match both of those branches. On Saturday, at 12.15, which branch, uh, first off, which branch is the request going to go to? First, first one. Watch out. The first one. Okay, good. Which branch do you think we want the request to go to? Yeah. Which one? Weekend. Probably the weekend. Yeah, because it is during the weekend. So it is important to think about order, about branch order. So for example, maybe these two all need to be moved around a little bit like that. So we'll put the weekend branch first, followed by the lunch hour, followed by business. Now, sad, let's see, Saturday at 1045, that's between Saturday and Sunday. That's going to go to the weekend branch. Wednesday, 
at 9 p.m. What's going to happen Wednesday at 9 p.m.? Uh, off hour. Maybe business hours or for break. Business hours is just 8 to 5. Uh, 8 p.m. Okay, so. Which branch? Fallback. It's going to go to the fallback branch. That's right. It's going to go to the fallback branch because it doesn't match the first three. And in this case, when you have a branch with multiple items, the fallback branch does not necessarily imply failure. The fallback branch can be our catch-all. Because we do have the off-hours. I heard somebody say off-hours resources. We do have that. But if we want, if we want, we could make the fallback branch a failure because we don't want anybody to access anything outside of these three time zones, time ranges. So those are are different kinds of branches that you're going to be working with. You're going to play with all of those throughout the next several hours. And you'll want to get to know all that. And you have to really think about sometimes, really put the logic behind what you're doing when you're planning these access policies. Last slide here is what do I want to make sure I have set in my virtual server? The serve, virtual server does have to have port 443. Uh, the virtual server does have to have an HTTP profile. The virtual server does have to have a client-side SSL profile. The wizard's going to do all that for you if you use the wizard, by the way. Also, further down, you'll see that we have the access policy section. Now, this is where the naming sometimes gets me a little frustrated with our UI, because we have the access policy section which contains the access profile setting, which this contains an access policy. <laughs> that's a little bit jumbled for me. But that's where I can specify the access profile that I created. And there are a couple of other settings that you will need to configure depending upon what you're deploying. For example, if this access policy gives out any portal resources, then you will need to have a rewrite profile. You could just use the default rewrite profile, by the way. You don't have to create a custom one. If the access policy is giving out any network resources or app tunnel resources, we'll talk about in lesson two, you need a connectivity profile. Again, you can just use the default one. Both of those are going to be done if you use the wizard. You don't have to worry about doing it yourself manually. If you are giving any remote desktop resources, you'll need this BDI profile. The wizard does not do that for you. That one you have to do yourself. And again, you can use the default BDI profile. You don't have to create a custom one. That's why I recommend to use the device wizard as often as possible, because it really does a lot of the hard work for you. And then you can just go in and do the fun work, which is using the access the visual policy editor, actually creating the visual access policy that you're creating. Any last questions before I lead you into your exercise? At this point, you should have an idea of why we're using APM, what an SLVPN is, the licensing, and the visual policy editor. The rest of the day, we're going to play with it a lot. So in your first exercise, uh, you're going to be accessing the Lorax Company intranet site, which you will see right now is not protected. Anybody on the internet can access the Lorax intranet site, which we don't want. So you will then use the uh, device wizard. It should just take you a matter of minutes, even less, to create your policy to protect that using authentication. And then once you are authenticating your users to the, to the uh, intranet site, then you'll go into the visual policy editor and take a look at that and make a couple of adjustments to your policy, such as adding a message box to users that aren't authenticating properly and redirecting them somewhere else other than just denying them access. So I'm gonna give you 30 minutes Plus, it'll be time for an extra uh, lab. Uh, sorry, a break. So it's nine forty-five. So let's take it till ten thirty, and at ten thirty, we'll move on to lesson two.